afternoon. Uh, it's my pleasure to welcome everyone to this talk with uh, Chris Aiken, the Roger William Strauss Professor of Social Sciences Emeritus uh, and Professor of Politics at Princeton University. Um, and his talk is on Trump's surge over the blue wall. Um, before I uh, uh, introduce Chris and, and, and turn the microphone over to him, I do want to acknowledge that the land on which the University of Toronto operates has for thousands of years been the traditional land of the Huron-Wendat, the Seneca, and most recently, the Mississaugas of the Credit River. And today it's still a meeting place to many indigenous people from across Turtle Island. And we're grateful to have the opportunity to work on this land. We're grateful to be here on it today. Um, I wanna to welcome Chris Aiken uh, to give a, a, a talk here. Chris deserves a very long introduction, but time is short. Uh, what I will say is that in, in addition to being a professor of politics at Princeton University, he uh, is, uh, uh, is a long running and important contributor to multiple fields of political science, to political methodology, to American politics, to the study of the European Union, and I think most centrally to the to the study of democracy as an empirical phenomenon. He's the author, the co-author of the of the seminal landmark book *Democracy for Realists*, um, which has really pulled the curtain back on on uh, on how voters really behave in in democracies and what that tells us about the potential shortcomings of uh, one of our most important institutions. He's gonna give a talk today about the 20, really uh, about the 2016 election, um, but in many ways about the elections before it and the election that we have um, coming up on uh, on Tuesday. Um, there's time for questions with, with Professor Aiken, so I'd encourage you to add questions to the, uh, using the Q&A function um, on Zoom, uh, and then we'll collect those and pose those um, in the course of my conversation with, uh, with Chris. So without further ado, Chris, it's wonderful to have you, if not uh, in person, then at least virtually, uh, joining us from Princeton, and I'll turn things over to you. Thanks for joining us. Thank you so much, Peter. It's an honor for me to be invited to give this presentation. I once visited the University of Toronto at a uh, uh, very early stage in my graduate school career, and I didn't have any money at all. So I slept behind a couch in one of the university buildings and was rousted at 5 a.m. by the custodian and, and told in no uncertain terms to, to move on. So uh, that was my youth and this is now. Uh, it's a pleasure to um, return virtually under, under other circumstances. Uh, I have a longstanding interest in Canada. My wife and I honeymooned in Montreal and it's always an honor to be asked to talk to, uh, can, to Canadians. I will uh, share my screen now and uh, we will get underway. So uh, this is the title of our, full title of our paper. I want to note my co-author, Jeremy Darrington, who's at the, the Princeton University Library and is a specialist on data management. Uh, this is an, not an easy subject with big data, and he is a crucial part of this, of, of this talk. Now, as probably uh, all or nearly all of you know, three American states, Wisconsin, Michigan, and Pennsylvania, uh, had voted Democratic for at least six straight presidential elections in 2016. And it was thought that they, they were for sure going to vote for Hillary Clinton. And they were therefore called the blue wall, blue for the Democrats and, and wall in the sense of being uh, impregnable. Uh, given the other states, Hillary Clinton won. She needed all three of them to become president, but she didn't get a single one. By the tiniest of margins, uh, fewer than 78,000 votes altogether, uh, Trump carried them all and, and became president. Now, the standard view uh, is uh, a little too often that uh, this was the fault of African Americans. And it is probably true, if you take a close look, that that, that drop uh, cost Clinton, Wisconsin, and Michigan. Uh, I should say that African American turnout was just dropping back to where it always is. It had been higher before that because of Obama running, but it went back to normal levels. That probably did make the difference in two of these states, but not in Pennsylvania, we think. And other people have come to that same conclusion. Pennsylvania was all Trump needed. 
So we think it's unfair to blame black people for the for uh, Clinton's loss and and their turnout. The bigger effect is white non-college people. So here is a plot by municipality of the shift, what we call the swing from Romney to Trump. So in each of these three states, above the red line means Trump ran better than, than Romney did. And below it means he ran worse. And what we've done in this graph is plot that swing against the percent of these municipalities with a college degree. And as you can see, in, it's exactly in the less educated municipalities that Trump gained relative to what Romney had done four years before. And those jumps are enormous. They come close to being 20% on average. And in some places, they're as much as 30%. These are, this is an earthquake in these states. I also note um, that out for you, that out to the right-hand side of each of these graphs is the story of what's happening in better educated communities. And as you can see, Trump is running worse in those than, than Romney did. And you will see um, in, in this coming election, uh, I suspect that that gets even worse as particularly with women in the better educated communities, the bottom is just dropping out for, for Trump's support. So where did this come from? And there are three main places from which it could have come and various people looking at the data have come to to the conclusion that each of these three things was the main driver. That is, there's still no agreement on, on uh, what the sources of these huge gains were. So one possibility is conversion. That is, some people voted for Obama and then were talked into voting for Clinton for uh, Trump four years later. So they changed from voting Democratic to voting Republican. That's conversion. Another possibility is mobilization that Trump got people to vote who had not voted in 2012 and may not have ever voted before in their lives. And the third possibility is demobilization, what McElwee and all call the missing Obama millions. That is people who voted for Obama in 2012, but then just abstained in 2016. They weren't motivated to go to the polls or they switched to a third party. So what is the relative importance of each of these? That actually, we don't, we don't know. And lots of money has been spent by various people and there's still continuing disagreement. We think we've done some things to uh, reduce or eliminate the problems that have plagued prior research. And I'll show you our results here. I'll, I'll add before I go to those that this actually matters. And the way that it matters is in debates about how to allocate resources. So when a party loses, they usually look back at the last election and see what the problem was, and they try to fix that. And that's what's going on with the Democrats. So for people who think that demobilization was the issue, they want to try to uh, get those people back again. And if you saw the Washington Post this morning, you can see that that's something Democrats are, are working on, people who stayed home in 2016. Other people think that conversion was, was more important and that trying to raise turnout of people who didn't vote last time is, is uh, something you shouldn't, you shouldn't bank on. So I'll skip that one. Um, so what we wanna do is in this paper is lay out a consistent framework for measuring all three things, conversion, mobilization and demobilization, get them on a common scale, which is often not been done. And then for, um, for this, these three states in the 2016 election, find out how important each of them was. And for data availability reasons, we use the sample of registered voters in the United States as the basis for our calculation. So when we say 
20% of the voters, we mean 20% of the registered voters. Now, in the paper, we show that these three effects add up, if they're properly defined, they add up to the total swing. So you can account for the swing, total swing among registered voters by Trump by simply adding these three effects. So we get a kind of simple additive decomposition of the vote switch. A lot of people have kind of noticed something like that, but we think we're the first to really spell it out in detail and, and prove it. And all the details are in, are in the paper. I am, in the interest of time, I'm going to skip this one. I'll just note that there are lots of simple ways of looking at problems of this kind, um, and they don't, they don't work. So what are, the, what are the estimation issues here? The first is that surveys have substantial problems in talking about turnout. So this is the CCES, the Cooperative Con Congressional Election Study. And it is the biggest 2016 academic study that's, that's uh, in the public domain. And this is the cross tab of how people, from that study, of how people voted last time in 2012 versus how they voted in 2016. So the marginals out there to the right tell you the vote total for Trump and for Clinton uh, in the uh, survey. And it's expressed there as a proportion of everybody who responded to the survey. And you can see that there's a very narrow Clinton victory in these three states on average. Uh, this one is for Wisconsin. Uh, it's a, a narrow Clinton victory, but very much within the margin of error for survey. So that, that looks just fine. Same cross tab, this is again, Wisconsin. When you look at the share of Romney and Obama voters from last time, that difference should be seven percentage points, and it's 11 in the survey. So that's concerning. And then the fraction of people who didn't vote or voted for a third party both times should be about 30% both times, So it's and it's way off. Why are there so few abstainers in these surveys? The answer is that as time has gone on, less engaged people, people who don't care much about politics, just don't respond to surveys. So we can't use surveys very well to talk about turnout. And in fact, uh, the recent election study by uh, Andre Blay and Elizabeth Gedengel and others that um, uh, appeared a few years ago has no chapter on voter turnout whatsoever. And, and that's why surveys have just become very unre unreliable. So, they don't, they don't work for the reasons I've said. Now we can also look at the voter rolls. Those are public in the United States and to a pretty good approximation. And they say whether the person voted in a particular election. So if you want to find out whether I voted in the school board election a couple of years ago in New Jersey, you can look me up and see whether I did. I mean, the answer is that I did. Those give good information about voter turnout. They record the actual appearance of people at the polls and they have all the registered voters, but they don't have anything about vote choice. So we have to do something about that. One way to do it is to guess what people in the voter rolls would have done if we could have interviewed them. That's what uh, Catalyst, which is the big Democratic Party uh, analysis firm, does. Um, but what you're doing there is asking the computer to invent some data that you don't have. And some of these ways of doing that are, are creative and technologically sophisticated, but it's always wise to be cautious about, I think, about uh, technologically sophisticated solutions. And I'm always reminded of 
the Roadrunner and Wile E. Coyote in that, in that regard, if you're familiar with that, with that cartoon. So what we prefer to do is to combine these two sources, surveys plus the voter roll, in a way that uses each to minimize the flaws of the other. And we, in the paper, we show how to do that using the fit to the actual vote returns as a, as a constraint. Um, this is a lot of work because you've got to match up census data done by the federal government with voter returns done by the states. And they don't even call the, all the municipalities by precisely the same name. Uh, it's, it's a lot of work. And my co-author did a lot of that. I did some as well. And, and that, is, that is what's behind this. We deleted a few dozen municipalities in total across these three states uh, who had missing data or just, you know, six votes. And that left us with 6,000 municipalities to, to work with. So the basic thing we do is we start with the CCES survey for each of them. They have about 900 observations in Wisconsin and then more in Michigan and especially more than 2,000 in Pennsylvania. We create a three category vote variable, Republican, Democratic and abstain or third party. And we then uh, rake, that's a technical survey research term. Uh, we rake to the actual numbers of those people to correct the fact that there aren't enough abstainers in the survey. And then we don't use turnout information from the survey. Instead, we use the voter files to get our turnout information. Uh, again, we have to do a little raking there, but we can then combine these two sources of data and solve for the unknowns. The unknowns here are uh, these underlying proportions of shifts. How many Romney people stayed with Trump? How many shifted to Clinton? How many abstained and so forth? There's actually nine things you need to know. We have uh, 13 constraints from the, from the data. So it's a, uh, gives you a, a matrix equation problem of rank nine. And we bootstrap the standard errors. Uh, details are in the paper. So here are the results for Wisconsin. The uh, Romney voters there are in the first column. The number there, the first number in the column is the 38.1 is the share of registered voters in Wisconsin who voted for Romney in 2012, this number. And then these are the proportions uh, who did various things. So we estimate that the proportion of Romney voters who uh, voted for Trump is just over three quarters, that about one in 25 of them switched to Clinton and about 20% of them abstained or voted for third parties and so on. Here's the equivalent Michigan numbers and here are the equivalent Pennsylvania numbers and I'm glad to talk more about any one of those in the, or all of them in the, in the question period. What you see with a more detailed look at those three uh, tables is that the first two columns in each state are similar. That is to say, Clinton uh, got about the same proportion of Romney voters in each state. Uh, Trump got about the same proportion of Obama voters in each state. And it's only in the third column for abstainers where there are real differences. And what you see there is less mobilization in, in Michigan, uh, particularly toward the Democrats and more in Pennsylvania. And the uh, crucial fact about that is that Pennsylvania was a battleground state. That is, there, was, there were huge amounts of money spent there. Now, in retrospect, all three were battleground states in the sense that the vote was extremely close. It was within a percentage point in all three, but people didn't know that. And it was only Pennsylvania that drew money. Battleground states have turnout go up because people are barraged with ads telling them how important the election is. So turnout was up about 2% in Pennsylvania. It was about 
uh, it was roughly flat in Michigan and it was down 2% in, in Wisconsin. So that procedure that I just outlined allows us to look at the amount of conversion and mobilization and demobilization that, that uh, was enjoyed by Trump in 2016. So I'll just do the middle column here. His, his shift, Trump's shift, his gain in Michigan was 6.3 percentage points of the registered voters relative to how well Romney had done. His, the proportion of that that's due to uh, conversion, we estimate, is just under 3%. We estimate that four and a half percent of it was due to mobilization and that he actually lost one percentage point due to demobilization. That is somewhat surprisingly, he lost more votes to, um, to third party voting than, than Clinton did. And you can see in each of these states that third party voting is up pretty dramatically in 2016 and that it's mostly libertarians who gain and those are mostly Republicans bailing out. And that's why he actually loses uh, due to uh, not so much to abstention as to uh, thir third party voting. So now if you look uh, ac across these columns, this for conversion and this for mobilization, you can see that both things, both things matter and they matter in different ways, slightly different ways in the, the three states, less mobilization in Wisconsin, but both things matter. And that's different from what other people have found. And, and it is exactly the use of the surveys to get better conversion estimates than other people have had that, that brings us out differently. So the conclusion here is that both of those things matter. So we can also look at uh, white municipalities. These are places with fewer than 5% African-American and fewer than 5% Latinx voters, and also less than 20% college educated. We apply the same procedure, we get these numbers. Now, notice that the, how much, how big these swings are. And that's what we saw in the uh, plots with which I started. These are the gains by Trump, the swing to Trump in these communities. And you can see that it's 15 percentage points or more in, in all three of them. If you now look at the amount due to conversion and mobilization, uh, you can see that it looks a lot like, qualitatively, a lot like the overall results, but that these numbers are just much larger. There's just a lot of electoral action going on in these, in these places. And then again, in uh, demobilization, contrary to what a lot of people have thought, Trump just breaks even or, or actually loses a little bit. So demobilization uh, didn't help him, but mobilization and conversion both mattered and they both mattered a lot in the places where he, ga he gained the most. So this is a realignment kind of shift. Um, Non-college whites have been moving to the Republicans since Bill Clinton. He did well with them, but Democrats since have not. Uh, and and this, But this is the biggest effect we've seen in recent elections. So we'll see whether uh, on Tuesday, whether that has, that has continued or, or whether Biden can pull some of those people back as I, as I expect. So conversion mobilization and minimizing demobilization we find that all of those matter. And again, that's a little different from, from what other people have, have said. We note here a couple of things. One is that the opponent matters a lot. So Hillary Clinton performed in one way. Um, Bernie Sanders would have performed in another, I think a little better in, in less educated communities and worse in better educated communities. But there isn't any one number called how Trump will do on conversion. It, it matters a lot who the, who the opponent is. 
And similarly, there's no one answer to how much does conversion matter in elections? It depends on the, depends on the circumstances. So those are my remarks. I have uh, lots of additional slides I can show you. Uh, I can go back to the, the ones I've already shown um, and uh, questions and criticisms uh, are, are very welcome. Thank you. Chris, thanks, thanks very, very, very much. Can I, can I just start with a, with a clarifying question? I just wanna make sure I, I understand definitional things here. So uh, conversion is, is effectively getting, if you're Donald Trump, conversion is getting a democratic voter from 2012 to vote for you in 2016. That's right. And mobilization is getting a, a non-voter from 2012 to vote for him in 2016. A non-voter or someone who voted for a third party. Now there were okay. extremely okay. few of okay. those so, in 2012. Yes. So it's basically yes. non-voters. So demobilization is just the opposite of that. Correct. It's, the, it's, it's someone who voted Republican in 2012, either staying home or voting for a third party. That's right. And as uh, several people have noted, uh, it's, it's worth remembering that when you pick up somebody from who didn't vote last time, you gain one vote on the margin. But when you switch somebody from the other side to your right. side, you gain two because they go down one and you go up one. So conversion is, we've taken that into account here, the conversion effects here do that. They count those changes as, as double on the margin. Yes. So so this this is very helpful. So I, I have a couple of opening questions for you, and then we can we can we can turn it over to any questions people have in the Q and A. We've got a very good one about about polling. I want to ask you about, but let's talk about the Democratic Party for uh, for for a moment. And I'll just preface it by saying that what strikes me about uh, what strikes me as remarkable about the study of elections is that is that we can be four years on from one of the most consequential elections in, in the last hundred years in the United States. And we still don't quite know exactly what happened. And it really is difficult for political parties, I think, and political movements to, um, to understand why they are where they are, because there's a bunch of competing explanations. There's a lot of myth. Um, there's a lot of things we want to believe to be true that may not be, and things that are true, which we don't want to believe to be, to be so. So I, I say that as a preface to this, to this question. How much of... Um, it, is it a fair interpretation that that the coalition that elected Barack Obama was was different enough from the from the core Democratic coalition because of who he was, both both a charismatic person, um, the first African American uh, major party candidate, uh, though he's much much more than that, obviously, but 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 that he had a he had enough of a unique appeal that that, um, that his election brought people into the democratic fold uh, or brought people in from from the margins of non-voting who normally would not have would not have been there and that as a consequence the party didn't didn't realize how weak its support was or, or at least grossly overestimated its support in 2016 and if that's true how much of that is a problem today i i couldn't agree more with what you said there peter i'll just add that i have looked at uh, the the uh, 2004 election in New Jersey. Uh, this is pre-Obama, of course. This is John Kerry. And the disappearance of less educated white voters in New Jersey begins then. So it, it isn't entirely Obama that's driving people out, at least not in this state. I haven't looked at that. Uh, in, in a lot of other states. But I do think that this is a, uh, what uh, VOK called a secular realignment. It's, it's a slow attrition over time of that group of, of voters. Larry Bartels and uh, Kathy Kramer are re-interviewing uh, those people who are still alive in the Jennings Nimi longitudinal study. These were people uh, who are exactly my age, actually, and were interviewed in in high school, and then three more times. And uh, they, Kathy and Larry, are finding that 
those people point to the cultural changes in the that happened in the in the last half of the 20th century as driving them the people in this category talk about those changes as driving them out of the democratic party so i think this goes by this goes back quite a ways and then when you have a black candidate for president something just inconceivable 50 years ago that really crystallized the the issue in the minds of of a lot of people so for those people hillary clinton uh, the stereotype of Hillary Clinton represented exactly what they don't like. Uh, this is the uh, hyper well-educated uh, Yale law graduate. Um, she and uh, and Bill were at Yale the same time my wife and I were. We didn't know them, but um, uh, that was it's it's that whole Ivy League uh, thing. And then she began. She referred to Trump voters as deplorables, and they just got a signal there that uh, the Democratic Party had left them. And do you have a sense, so um, it must be, I mean, it's, it's, it's more than simply Hillary Clinton though, right? I mean, it's, it, it, it's, it's something about, the, about the, the overall nature of the Democratic Party, right? And so, so a yes. follow-up question to this is, what is the, where, does, where does Biden fit in this? I mean, he's a, Biden is unique, right, in that, in that uh, and that among Democratic candidates for the presidency in the last, since, since the year 1992, he's the only one who's not Ivy League educated. He, uh, uh, he certainly comes from uh, a very middle class background. He lived in Scranton for a short period of time, but he reminds everyone of this, of this regularly. But, mm -hmm. he's, but he's a genuinely middle class candidate, comes from Delaware, mm -hmm. um, educated at, at very average American schools, and has a certain, certain sensibility about him. Um, does it do anything beyond the level of veneers to uh, uh, to uh, to change the coalition, or is it or is it simply that he's he's you know uh, that his polling fortunes are not a function of him reversing that, but just a, a function of people being tired of Donald Trump or or something else? Well, I think that there are sectors that are tired of Trump, and we're, that we're going to see that movement um, in two thousand eight. Obama got some votes because the economy had collapsed uh, by people who just had no idea necessarily what he stood for. The, the, um, I, I, it's hard to know about Biden. As you say, he is, you know, he's not a young man. And in, in some ways, he represents an older version of the Democratic Party. He's, He's, uh, he's Catholic, he's the kind of place that can walk into a bar and feel very comfortable. Uh, he's going to get votes that uh, it's hard to know who else who was running this time could have gotten. Uh, the only other candidate who was a little bit like that is Amy Klobuchar and, and uh, the Senator from Minnesota. <laughs> and she would have had, you know, she's a woman and, and that's, uh, that's a problem for some male voters. So Biden is just, I think, extremely well positioned. Uh, he doesn't scare people. The Republicans have uh, been pushing in their ads uh, two different attacks on him. One is that he's sleepy and mentally defective and can't do anything. And the, the other is that he's a wicked schemer with an aggressive plan to remake America. And he's thinking about it all the time. And, you know, you can have one of those, but you can't have both, and nothing has really stuck. So they're they've struggled to find a way to get at him, and and uh, that's going to help him, I think. Yeah. Can you? Uh, I've one more follow up on this, which is I I I'd like you to just speak to the, the sort of competing hypotheses that exist about about the current state of of support for the Republican Party, and and and. I don't think they're mutually exclusive, but one of those hypotheses is that there's been a long-term, and they're, they're difficult to separate, that there's been a long-term decline in American manufacturing, there's been a long-term decline in um, in uh, the economic basis of, of prosperity in, in states running from, from Pennsylvania West all the way through to uh, to the Rocky Mountains, and that, and that this kind of long-term uh, uh, 
falling apart of, of the manufacturing sector in the US, the decline of private sector unionization, that this has that this has led to this kind of reorganization has left a bunch of people out. And in fact, it's economic despondency and hopelessness that are what is driving their support into the Republican, into the Republican Party. And that finds its, you know, that finds you can read Hillbilly Elegy for a for a nice account of that. You could read, you could read more drier works that you and I would read uh, on voting behavior to get at that. There's another account, which is which is which is an expanded one of the one you've talked about with cultural change, that it's about not only cultural change but change in the racial order in the United States, um, the sense of a lack of supremacy of certain values or or certain people, indeed white people, um, uh, with the with the with the you know with the with the diversity that's that's now commonplace in America, and that this isn't really about economics, but it's about culture and it's about really about people. Uh, having trouble reckoning with issues of race um, and, and 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 prejudice at its core. What's the? I mean, these these are not always mutually exclusive. But what's your sense of how we can understand those two arguments side by side? That that part of this is about economics and part of it is about about race in America. Jeremy and I actually intended this paper originally to be directed to that question, um, but it was so obvious in our data that economics is not what's going on. And other people have made the same point. There's a consensus now, I think, that the second interpretation is much closer to the truth. The average Trump voter is not poor and struggling. Um, they're also, uh, you know, not as a group, upper middle class prosperous, but they're, they're uh, not in the kinds of declining communities that were talked about so much. Um, those those places often uh, swung less to Trump than did rural areas doing just fine that are heavily white. So I, I think it's pretty clear at this stage that it's uh, that it is white identity that's the issue, and we know that education is powerfully correlated with that sort of thing. We've known that for. Uh, almost a century now. And uh, so it, it, is a, it is cultural threat of a certain, of a certain kind. And this is, a, of course, an extremely common feature of human life that people who, are, who are, have been dominant and, and are used to a certain social hierarchy uh, become quite unhappy when that's when that's threatened, and you can see that in the Brexit vote, for example, where uh, attitudes toward immigrants were a key factor in explaining that. It it isn't the people who live in the areas with a lot of immigrants and are potentially economically threatened by them that voted for Brexit. It's the ones out in the uh, more rural and small town areas of, of Britain where there are very few immigrants and where they're not an economic threat of any kind, um, but where people are used to uh, Britain being a certain kind of a place, which it is, which it is increasingly less. And uh, it's, it's that where the opposition came from. So just a little ad addition here, uh, there's a lot of immigration in Canada. And uh, I think as an outsider, uh, I don't understand it as well as, as Canadians do, but uh, I'll be surprised if there aren't some uh, movements in the direction of uh, white identity politics in Canada over the, next, over the next 20 years. Yeah, I mean, I think we have the, just, just on that matter, I mean, I think as, as, I mean, as you well know, I mean, we've got a, we have we have two things that help in this, I think, right? One is that there's a there's a long experience of co-ethnic power sharing, really. You know, I mean, it was a, it was between French and English, which which mm -hmm. matters at the elite level, right? Mm -hmm. And the other is that our that our, our history with race is very complicated, but very different from the US one, right? And that in that we don't have the legacy to the same degree in the overriding degree of of slavery. Mm -hmm. And and uh, uh, as our country becomes more diverse, um, we come to a place where there's uh, where there's no single group that seems large enough to be to be to be dominant. And I think that helps at the at least at least at the margin. 
So in your numbers, when we see that it's kind of non-college educated whites that are doing all the movement, it's not about the kind of jobs that they're in. It's not about the, the place they have in the economy as a result of um, being non-college ed educated. It's a result of what they believe in their attitudes that's, that's, that's driving the movement to Trump in 2016. Yes, I don't say that it's 100% that, but it's clearly a far more powerful effect than the economic stuff. Yeah, and we have a question here from Zeus Eden who, who asks about Ohio uh, and notes that uh, Obama won it in 2018 or 2008 and 2012. Um, Zeus attributes it to uh, mobilization, um, but in 2016, Ohio went overwhelmingly for Trump and Biden does not even bother to campaign there. So what are your views of the kind of long run trends in Ohio? And I'll just, I'll note that I, I, I find it's a particularly interesting question because if you wanted to pair up, if you wanted to create a grouping of states and you had Pennsylvania, Michigan, and uh, Wisconsin in those, Ohio would be the most logical fourth one to put in that group, right? So why is Ohio going in one way and those other three, why did Ohio go in one way, the other three are going in another way? And, and why is Ohio just not in the cards this time? I taught for um, almost 15 years at the University of Michigan. So, uh, and the Ohio State Michigan game is not that many weeks away. So asking me about Ohio, Ohio this time of year is not likely to get an entirely unbiased and uh, helpful response. But it is simply the case that, that Ohio is different. And to uh, build on what you just said, Peter, about the history of, um, of American slavery, which of course is, is crucial to our history. Southern Ohio is quite Southern. Uh, if yeah. you, if you uh, drive across the Southern border of Ohio, you are in Kentucky with, you know, bourbon and racehorses, and it's a very different place than say Detroit. Um, and Cincinnati, which is located there, uh, has a long history of, um, uh, you know, pro-slavery sympathies and 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 so on. So it Ohio is um, uh, simply a different place from the other three. The other three are are fully northern, and Ohio really isn't. And so the it it seemed to me um, in 2016 just remote that Clinton would carry Ohio, uh, but she spent huge amounts of money there, put staff into, into that state, and then, as you say, was, was beaten really badly. And by contrast, did very little in Wisconsin and Michigan. And I, I don't think it's much question that if she'd ignored Ohio and put time into the other two, she'd have carried them, she'd have carried them both. But, but there is a different, there is a different history in Ohio from the other three. You're being affirmed here in the comments by Michael Donnelly, who's a Southwest Ohio boy, as you, uh, as, you okay. as he notes, and as you, as you probably, as you probably know, we have a question here. Uh, let's, let's shift a little bit to 20 to 2020. And then I want to actually shift way, way back. Uh, we have a question here from uh, Karishma uh, Persausi, who asks, I'm wondering the extent to which national polls can adequately estimate the current voting propensity of American citizens um, and then, and then they give some examples of last year, um, um, undersampled white, uneducated males, uh, which oversampled educated voters, as you well know. This is a person who understands this very well. So what's your, what's your sense of, uh, uh, and just, I think the, the larger context of this is, is that, is that both polling houses and aggregators have perhaps been aggressive in their, in their, in their post hoc corrections of polls, uh, certainly after 2016 and in this election to try to, to try to account for what they see as shortfall. So for those people who are actively watching the polling numbers and actively kind of, you know, re refreshing real clear politics, what should we know about the, about, about the challenges of polling now? And what should we know about what these polls are telling us? Well, as uh, probably most of the people listening here know very well, polling has gotten a lot more difficult. So when the American National Election Study began in the 1950s, people were delighted and honored to respond to a two, two hour survey with someone sitting in their living room asking them questions uh, was new at that at that point and there weren't the kinds of uh, tensions between uh, universities and and Republicans that 
that there are now. So response rates were, uh, if you worked hard, um, 60, 70 percent in that in that period, and and sample biases were small. It's gotten much more difficult, and a lot of the polls you see now um, in um, places like 538.com and and Real Clear Politics, those response rates are. 10% or sometimes even less. So we're relying, we as a group profession, people who use surveys and, and, and do them, are relying on survey weights. And uh, I have said to a couple of, uh, several times to groups of graduate students, if you want to do a really boring dissertation that will guarantee a comfortable lifetime income, figure out how to do survey weighting better than we're doing it now because you will be in intense demand and it's going it's not going to become uh, less consequential so you know we've generally been able to ignore education in the years before 2016 as a weighting variable because the postgrads were too democratic the uh, less educated people were also more democratic and the people in the middle with just a BA were Republican. So it, it kind of averaged out over the, over the three and having too many postgrads was, was balanced by having too few people without uh, college education. Uh, and that was okay because they had the same preferences. Now they don't. And so the undersampling of less educated whites in 2016 was a problem in in those states that have a lot of them and that's where the errors were contrary to what a lot of people think the polls were basically pretty good in 2016 they got about 44 or 45 states uh right and one or two of the errors were you know didn't matter uh, but they didn't do well in those in the three blue ball states and and that's the reason. So the people who do surveys now, I've talked to them, um, and we all, we're all, everybody's in a conversation about it. They think they have that fixed, and they're they're waiting on that. Um, w e i g h t i n g, and the rest of us are waiting w a i t i n g to see whether they really do have it fixed. I'm expecting that they do, but surveys and survey weights are not an exact science. And so if you're cautious, um, you want to discount the surveys a little bit. And, and 538 does a good job of that, actually. Um, they, they put in a correction for the unknown unknowns. And I think that's, that's necessary. Can you, can you give, zoom out a little bit, Chris, please? And give us, give us a sense of, um, about the, the, how should I say this, the kind of the multidimensional nature of American politics, and I'll phrase the question in a much more specific way in this sense, that, that, that a lot of what we were interested in, uh, in understanding between 2016 and 2020, and in really for the period of Obama was, was what it meant to have an African American president and, and what this meant for the engagement of African Americans in, in American politics. Obviously, much of Donald Trump's um, term in office has been, has been consumed by his obsession with with Hispanic immigration um, to the United States, um, but this all is happening in the context of a of of an America that's getting more multicultural, um, um, and it's not simply three groups in America, but of course dozens of dozens of groups. What is the uh, so I ask a question, which is kind of a general form of a question we've been asked in the uh, about about Indian voters in the United States. But what's the what's the what are we learning right now about kind of the uh, racial politics in the United States um, that, uh, uh, that we didn't know before? The reason why I ask is because there's a lot of contention that Donald Trump is actually doing better among among various uh, non-white groups than uh, than the media will will allow for, for example, right? But the other bit of it is is that the Democratic Party has long actually had a very very um, diverse coalition that hasn't always been as as stable and faithful as it would hope it would uh, would be. So what's your sense of what kind of insight can you give us, I guess, is the short version of this question on 
on multiculturalism in politics in the United States. Are we seeing a realignment of that? Is the Democratic Party able to, to continue to, to hold advantages across all groups or is something else happening? Trump uh, seems to have done better than one would expect in 2016 among uh, some uh, minority sectors, as you say, Peter. So it's, it's hard to study some of them because they're so small, but the best evidence we have, it, for example, is that he did better among African-American males than Democratic candidates, uh, than Republican candidates usually do. And it, it may be that uh, the same kinds of appeals, um, the sense of being a, a strong leader uh, that some people have from Trump worked in those minority groups, just as it did with uh, less educated whites. Um, for people who are actually in leadership positions in, in the society, and uh, uh, he's the last thing you'd look for in a leader, but, um, but, he's, but he sounds good to, to a lot of people, and that's, that seems to have worked. Similarly, with, with uh, Latinx voters, um, you know, they are, as a group, religiously conservative. They're pro-family. A lot of them are small business owners. They are a natural Republican constituency in, in a lot of ways. And um, if, if they're not um, driven out by the kind of rhetoric that Trump has engaged in. So uh, he will get some fraction of the Latinx vote, maybe a quarter or so. It's what he got last time. Uh, or a little more, and um, you know, there's, it, it's just, it's just never the case that any group of human beings is defined entirely by their demographics. That said, as as you were saying, it it is increasingly the case that the Democratic Party is prosperous and successful whites plus all the minorities, and the Republicans are uh, less educated whites, uh, evangelicals, and then small business people, and, and some corporate, some corporate people as well, who, who like the, you know, the tax cuts and, and the lessened government regulation. So there's, you know, most of the Trump voters in 2016 were generic Republican voters voting Republican for the same reason that they always do. Um, it's, I have concentrated in the paper with Jeremy on the shifts because that's what made the difference. But uh, the shifts are one thing, and then the regular base, which was there in 2016, is, is another. And you can see that, uh, you know, Trump's been all over the map ideologically in his life, but as president, he has pretty much done what Republicans wanted to do. The exceptions are the uh, aggressive anti-immigration rhetoric as, that you mentioned, and then also the um, international isolationism, uh, which is uh, he shares with Bernie Sanders, um, and and which does not represent the at least recent position of the of the Republican Party. It's more like what Republicans were in the '30s. Michael Donnelly is asking a question about. Um what this realignment analysis tells us about long-term Senate prospects uh, for balance. And as long as culture remains the dominant cleavage, are the Democrats in trouble or can people like Sherrod Brown, maybe Biden change the subject for, for Democrats in the Senate? I do think that, um, that as the question implies, I do think that getting candidates um, like that, um, you know, again, I'm from Montana, uh, there are two senators per state. Uh, Montana has one Democrat and one Republican in spite of being a, uh, um, you know, heavily leaning Republican state. And it's the Democratic senator there is John Tester. And he is, he is not a Tony East Coast Democrat. Um, he wouldn't be comfortable at Manhattan cocktail parties. Um, my wife is, uh, was a fundraiser before she retired. I have been to quite a few Manhattan cocktail parties. I'm not that comfortable either. So 
the um, cultural differences there are are very real, and Democrats have to get people who can um, who who fit that. And, and uh, Biden is Biden is exactly that. Uh, and as I say, Amy Klobuchar is too. Amy Klobuchar runs well ahead of Democratic candidates in Minnesota for that reason. Um, so, uh, you know, I believe in federalism. Um, Manhattan is a different place from Topeka, Kansas, and they need their own kind of government. Um, Canada, of course, even more federal than, than the U.S. is. And, and uh, you know, I suspect Canadians feel, as I do about the United States, that it, it's in a big continent-wide country, you need... Uh, you need subdivisions, and in those subdivisions, you, you got to know the territory. So I, I do think that Democrats, Democrats are running a lot of uh, candidates with military background this time, for instance. Uh, one of my graduate students is studying that. She's the daughter of a naval officer, and, and uh, they use it in exactly the way that people like Sherrod Brown or, or John Tester um, do in, in uh you know, these more conservative states. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna take the liberty of asking the final question. And uh, in doing it, I'll just, I'll just do a real quick setup, which is that, um, you know, you've been a, I learned a lot from, I've learned, we've been friends for a long time. And I've learned a lot from you and that you, you're kind of one of the people who's done the most to advance the quantitative study of elections. But I recall we were having meeting for lunch once at Princeton and you came carrying a book and I said, what is this book? And you said, well, there was a county in, I'm going to say in Wisconsin in 1916 that shifted overwhelmingly. I'm going to get the year wrong to the Republican Party. And I'm trying to figure out why there was such a big shift in that county. And I learned <laughs> from that that the study of elections takes the, the pretty deep engagement with the most uh, esoteric yes. parts of uh, electoral geography. Looking at, you've got a really long, you've got a long view of American politics. This is a big election coming yes. up on Tuesday. What's the election that it's that it's most similar to in your in your um, in your reading, and and what does that tell us about the importance of it, and what we should be looking for on Tuesday night and Wednesday morning, and the two months after that? I've given that some thought, and um, uh, let me give you one spe speculation, which is not, I think, the most likely outcome of this election, but it's a possible outcome and, and one that's, I think, interesting to think about. And that's 1852. Um, in 1852 was the last uh, election that the Whig party contested. Uh, they were the other party besides the other major party besides the Democrats. And, uh, you know, we've had Republicans for so long that we forget that, that we didn't always have them. And in 1852, we did not. So the Whigs broke up in 1852, and they broke up into two pieces. Uh, and one of those two pieces was the nascent Republican Party, which was formed in 1854, um, both Michigan and Wisconsin claimed them uh, claimed to be the birthplace, but it was definitely an upper Midwest phenomenon initially. And the other party was the so-called American party, which was the know-nothings. And they were focused on anti-Catholicism. In that period, um, black people were, uh, you know, still slaves mostly. And, and so they were outside the political system. And a lot of the tensions, there was substantial immigration in that period. A lot of the tensions were Protestant Catholic tensions. Catholic churches were burned to the ground in this period in places like Philadelphia, for example. <laughs> so um, there was a split and the, the uh, Democrats sailed on, but the Whigs broke into the faction that uh, was the Republicans and wanted to focus on slavery. And they were going to be anti-Catholic, but they were going to be subtle and about it. And the know-nothings who essentially wanted to ignore slavery and focus on the threats that Catholicism posed to Protestant hegemony. 
And it, at that, so in 1856, we had a three-way race. And at that point, no one knew whether the know-nothings or the Republicans were going to be the successors to the Whigs. I think it's possible that the Republican Party will come under sufficient stress um, that, that a party split might happen. Uh, you can hear the two wings of the, of the party sharpening their knives for the post-election period already. Uh, they're having more and more trouble living with each other. And the fact that two, um, you know, two Republican leaders in the House of Representatives were, uh, were speak to two Republican speakers were driven from office by this tension shows you how hard it has become for the two parts of the party to live with each other. So one, one viewpoint, the so-called burn it down faction uh, is these are Republicans who are voting a straight democratic ticket this time and hoping that the house majority for the Democrats will be increased. The Senate will be lost. There'll be a, be a Republican, uh, be substantial Republican losses and, and a democratic majority in the Senate and a big victory for Biden. And that the inference from that will be that the whole Trump thing was a kind of deviation and ought to be put aside. And we ought to go back to establishment Republicans like Romney and McCain and, and George W. Bush. The other group, uh, and I, I have to say, I think they're more, they're a much larger group, uh, thinks, well, you know, I'm not very enthusiastic about Trump some of the time, but He's better than he's better than those crazy socialist Democrats, and we need to at least protect the Senate Senate majority. If that group is successful and they they hold the Senate, um, then I think we're going to see more Trump type candidates from uh, running in the primaries in in uh, 2024, and the future of the Republican Party will be at stake, I think. So I've been saying uh, that I think the most important item on the ballot next Tuesday in this country uh, is not any individual race, it's the future of the Republican Party. And I think that that's yet to be determined. Chris, thanks very much for joining us. Um, we, have a, we have everything in abundance but time. Uh, so we really appreciate you giving that, uh, giving that to us and uh, helping us not only understand the last election and this one that's coming up, but uh, the much broader sweep of American politics and American history. So thanks very much. You're welcome back at Toronto anytime. And uh, we look forward to having you back in the future. Thank, thank you so much, Peter. And uh, thanks to the audience for those good questions. And I look forward to uh, putting my foot back on the Toronto campus sometime when I don't have to sleep behind the couch. Likewise. Wonderful, Chris. Thank you so much.